we're going to be talking about the Lightning Dev Kit. Um, and just like for a little show of hands, I know, I know Paul did a show of hands last week, and that was really helpful. Um, who, who's at least familiar with Lightning? Um, just kind of like the basics of how it works. Um, that's good. Oh, we got, nice to see you. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, my, my dear friend is coming to give me a hug. Thank you. Good to see you, David. Good to see you. Awesome. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah I, I can give like a little introduction to Lightning to start it off with um, and then kind of go from there. I mean, you know, some people may be familiar with like LND, um, the Lightning Labs implementation of a Lightning network. And then um, there's also CLN, um, Eclair, and, and those are kind of the major ones. But, you know, Lightning from a, um, light, I, I thought about how to do this workshop and like how to make it the most involved um, with LDK and it, it, it it was going to be really hard to try to get something hands-on um, at the end of the day, just because there is a lot to it. You know, Paul last week did a BDK workshop, and that was you know really cool, and, and it was an introduction to Rust. Um, and but that was you know with BDK you can you can spin up a Bitcoin wallet or sorry a Bitcoin address you know really easily because it doesn't involve any networking, doesn't involve any peers. Um, you just have a private key, and then you you spin up an address. With with Lightning, it's a lot more involved where you know, you do, it is like a running node. So it's got to do all the peer to peer connection and communication. It's basically a payment channel between you and another peer. It's a, it's a two of two Bitcoin address that you guys both lock funds. Uh, you know, one person locks funds into it. Maybe you can do two at the same time. Um, but you kind of start out with, um, you, you put funds into a payment channel. Um, and then you can route those funds across all of your other peers. Um, payment channels as well. So you kind of get a entire graph of um, nodes that can send payments between each other. And, and maybe I should have put a little bit of an introduction um, to Lightning there, but that's kind of like the basics. So there's a lot a lot more involved in doing a Lightning-based wallet than, than a Bitcoin wallet. Um, and I'll, I'll get to a part of this too um, where we kind of go through some of what is involved in, in a Lightning wallet. But uh, yeah, maybe just jumping ahead here a little bit, but a little bit about me. Um, I've been a Bitcoin Lightning dev for, for quite a while now, most of my career really. Um, worked at Bottle Pay, Impervious, Voltage. I've contracted at a lot of various companies, typically working on the Bitcoin and Lightning side of things. Um, and then now I'm transitioning into a new role of being the CEO of, of Muni Wallet. So that's, I do that with Ben um, Carmen, who's in the room today, sub Ben. Um, and then Paul Miller, who, who couldn't make it today. But he did that whole Rust workshop last week, so you guys are all all super familiar with Rust right, right now, right? Like, you all read uh, the Rust book, the entirety of it. <laughs> okay, so, you know, I, I said I wanted to make this a little hands-on at first, but then was struggling with it. So here's kind of like what we'll do um, what you'll get out of this workshop. We'll, we'll learn what LDK actually is, um, and then the differences between LDK and some of the other implementations like LND. Um, we'll learn what can be done with LDK itself, some, um, some example applications that exist, some that I've created, some really cool ones that other people have created as well. Um, then we'll kind of go through a little bit of like how to get started with LDK itself. Um, there's, there's a lot of really cool stuff that you can approach, um, a lot of different angles you can approach LDK-based applications. So I'll start to get into like how to get started with it. Um, we'll do a little bit of a walkthrough of some of the LDK tutorials that exist. Um, and then you know maybe at the end, um, I'll show an example LDK application that, uh, that, that we built. So what, what is the Lightning Dev Kit? Um, so I took this quote from their own website um, I think it's just lightningdevkit.org. And it says it's the simplest way to integrate Lightning into your Bitcoin wallet. And I'm going to have to say that's a lie. <laughs> uh, if I were to rephrase it, it would maybe be the best way to integrate a non-custodial Lightning, uh, non -custodial Lightning into your Bitcoin wallet. Um, LDK isn't the easiest to get started with. So, so simply saying it's the simplest way is, is kind of a lie. There's, there's a lot involved with it. You know, it's still you know, early in the Lightning development kit. 
um, itself, but it's it's not the easiest. There's there's quite a bit involved in making um, a Lightning wallet. Like I said earlier, it's not just like a Bitcoin wallet where you create an address, you check to see if it has funds, um, and you sign transactions. There's there's a lot more involved with it, um, and, and we'll kind of get into that a little bit. But you know what what it is really good for, and I will say you know the emphasis on the dev kit part. Um, you know, despite it being a lot more difficult than other, uh, you know, lightning solutions that exist, um, you really get the customizability that you really need when building a lightning wallet. And I know, you know, as we're you know, building out Mutiny and some of the other things I've done with LDK, um, it's just like, it's some of the things that I wouldn't be able to do with LND otherwise, or LND or CLN or some of the other solutions. So um, it's really just like, you know, the, the lightning dev kit team, they work on the hard protocol stuff themselves, um, and they kind of packaged it up into a tool that you can use in your own way. Um, one example of that would be um, storage. So like they don't make any particular bias on how you store data. Um, it's not like an SQL database that you have to use or Postgres, or if you're familiar with LND, I think it's not RocksDB, it's uh, Bolt DB. Um, you don't have to use any of those solutions at all. You can literally, that could be a simple key value store. It could be an SQL database. It could be in the cloud somewhere if you wanted it to be. Um, so they, they make no bias on the storage. They just say, here's a data structure. Um, it's time for you to save it. So, you know, hook in a storage component um, that has these interfaces. Um, and then you can get, then you can save that data and the LDK doesn't really care how you, how you save that data. Um, there's a lot of examples of that when you're building the Lightning Dev Kit, such as blocks. Like, how do you fetch the blocks? Um, do you have to connect to Bitcoin D? Do you have to, um, you know, use some of their solutions? And you don't. You, you get to decide how you give it block data. Maybe you give it block data from Explora. Um, like you know, blockchain.info. That's something that we do for for Mutiny Wallet. Or you can point it to your own um, Explorer instance. Or maybe you literally just have like a centralized server that is just like giving it block data. And you're you know maybe that's fine for your use case. Um, it kind of just like it, it it tries to not introduce as many biases at all. Um, but you know that said, like it won't just magically give you Lightning capabilities. You can't just like plug a package in and then all of a sudden you have Lightning. Um, not yet. Um, at least, uh, and this and this won't solve a lot of the problems that Lightning already has today. Um, you know, you still got to solve the problems like inbound liquidity. Um, that's always going to exist, um, or at least for the time being. Uh, there's some solutions there. Voltage just launched one that I, I worked on for um, getting just-in-time uh, liquidity, which was really cool. Um, also, doesn't solve Lightning offline receives. Um, so, like, if you put an LDK based wallet on a phone. Um, a lot of people don't know this with like Moon Wallet, but if you have Moon Wallet and you create an invoice, um, and then let's say you send it to someone and you go to bed, um, you're, you're not that payment won't complete until you open the Moon Wallet again, um, and that's uh, that's a problem with a lot of Lightning wallets today. I know on Android there's some background task stuff that can go on, and, and there's some fancy stuff you can do with push notifications on Apple to kind of try to solve that, but. Um, you know, uh, one of the things that's really cool about the Lightning Dev Kit is that they do, since they work on the hardcore like Lightning Protocol stuff, um, they get to tackle some of these hard problems in Lightning, and then and then you you finish the rest, you build the application side of it. So they are working on offline receives, um, and they said I think they said it's going to be either like this quarter or next quarter where they have that in to LDK. So they're going to be moving, in my opinion incredibly fast on protocol stuff. And then, you know, it's, it's the developer's job to kind of do the rest. Um, so yeah, I think, and, and by the way, like, feel free to ask any questions throughout all this. I, I do want to, you know, make this as interactive as possible since we're not doing as much um, hands-on side of it. So um, that's kind of just like my intro to the Lightning Dev Kit. Um, I wanted to kind of compare it a little bit to the other solutions um, that exist, but any any initial thoughts on LDK or or questions on, on what it is. Cool. Um, yeah, I just want to go briefly into like the Lightning Node ecosystem just for comparisons. I, I know, um, you know, LDK is, is solving something with uh, a little bit of a different approach. Um, LND, most people are probably familiar with it. Um, you may have one on like an Umbral or a Voltage node. Like, you know, you can put on a Raspberry Pi, or you can put it in a server. Um, has really good 
APIs for interacting with it, but the problem is like it has to be running and it has to be online. So if you're building a Lightning application that uses LND, um, you have to communicate to that LND node, so it has to live somewhere and it has to be always running and, on, and online. You can try to do some things where you can embed it into your application, like Breeze does this, for example, but it's a very heavyweight solution and they had to do quite a bit of forks um, on LND to, to kind of like get it to the place where they wanted it to be. So in the end, it's like just not as as customizable as they need it to be for it, for it being an embedded um, application. So, and then once you start forking LND, you know, it kind of leaves you vulnerable. If you if you do a lot of forks on LND, you kind of have to maintain all those up, upstream changes, and then you kind of you know if there's any conflicts, you have to resolve them. And then if you're running forks, you know, it hasn't been tested on the main branch um, as as much as their thorough QA is. So it kind of like leaves you a little vulnerable there. Um, CLN is another good solution. Um, uh, they have a really great plugin system, which I love. It's not it's written in C, so like you know not not a lot of devs these days do anything with C. I know I know I don't, <laughs> um, but it is lighter weight than LND, um, but the APIs aren't great. Um, and it still needs to be always online, but they're doing some integrations with Greenlight that is almost sort of like. Um, a node in the cloud, but the keys are on the user's device, which which is a really cool concept, and we'll probably start seeing more while it's use, utilized something like that. And then there's Sinclair. Um, no one really uses it besides the async team. It's also writ written in Scala, like the worst programming language that exists. Um, so sorry, sorry Ben. Uh, but um, what what is cool about this is is they. They've done something, you know, they are the largest node on the network, and they kind of have this architecture that allows them to have, like, channels on different servers. So the thing that manages their channels are distributed across multiple servers, so it kind of has the scaling capability. Um, and then they also put a version, a stripped-down version of Eclair onto their Phoenix wallet, um, which is a mobile application for, for, for sending and receiving Lightning. Um, but, but, yeah, besides, besides Phoenix... The Phoenix wallet itself, and besides Eclair, you know, no one, no one really uses it. Um, so, so how is LDK different than all these? And I, I kind of explained this a little bit earlier, but the other ones, all those examples were complete applications. So, with with LDK, you have to come in and build it all yourself. You have to build all the application logic. Um, how are you going to interact with this LDK node? Um, you may want to also put it onto a server with your own HTTP APIs. And that's kind of the cool thing is that, you know, if you ever used um, some of the APIs and you weren't quite happy with them, well, now it's <laughs> you're the API creator. Um, so you do the job and then you, you make the APIs exactly what you want it to be. Um, and then you can interact with it that way. So you can make it a daemon that lives on a, on a server. Um, you can bet it straight into your application, and then you can also, what's really cool is you can distribute various parts of the LDK into different places. And I think like one of the examples of that um, is the validating Lightning Signer project. They take um, the keys, the, the LDK part that manages the keys, and they put it onto the user's device, or, or I think they've even done some like embedded solutions um, that is like on a little $5 chip, and that does all the signing. Um, meanwhile, the node itself, the running process, is on a server somewhere, but the keys are in a different spot. Um, and in, in theory, you can you can distribute out many different parts of the LDK modules into different places as well. Um, some of the pros: highly customizable. Um, you know, you pick how you store the data, you pick how you fetch the blocks, even networking with the peers. Um, is one. I know for Mutiny, like one of the things, you know, Lightning Network nodes, um, they use TCP to talk to other nodes on the network. And if you're running something in the browser, so like, you know, what we're doing at Mutiny, we're putting a whole Lightning node inside of a web browser using WebAssembly. Um, we can't talk TCP out of, a, out of a web browser. So we created our own networking layer on, on LDK that allows you to connect to a WebSocket proxy, um, and then that WebSocket proxy converts it to a TCP stream and sends all the data out that way. Um, so that's like one of the cool things is that 
we wouldn't have been able to do that with L and D by any means. Um, we would have had to fork L and D for one, also try to get it to run um, WebAssembly, which you know there has been some people that have tried that before, and it's not. I think they've given up by then. Um, but then we also would have had to do this whole WebSocket proxy thing, write that all in Go, and then um, you know ship that as well. So, like I said, the customizability part of LDK is just miles beyond anything else. Um, uh, you know, but you do have to kind of bring in your own Bitcoin wallet part. So it doesn't do any of the on-chain stuff. Um, so it's quite often coupled with BDK, um, which which Paul went over last week, um, to do all the on-chain signing and things like that. But also one of the cool things with LDK, and this is partly why I didn't want to do like a hands-on coding workshop of this is because there's multiple language bindings. So, you know, the core of it is written in Rust, um, but they have bindings in Swift, uh, Java, TypeScript, I think even C as well, um, so that you can, you can be an application developer. You don't have to know any Rust at all to use LDK. Um, you can even like, you know, this is kind of like what we do in a way, but um, you can even like run this and you're like React native application or your or just your react itself um, and use all the typescript bindings to interact with LDK in the same exact way that a rust developer would or a Java Java developer or Swift developer and and I don't I don't think those bindings are just like explicit just these so like if there were developers out there that wanted it in Golang um, or a different language I'm sure they could probably come up with uh, with bindings for those as well. Um, other pros to it, super lightweight. You can, um, one of the things that we do, um, and Sensei does as well, is like this concept of spinning up many nodes on the same instance. So, like if you tried to do that with LND, you would pretty much need multiple, <laughs> multiple Raspberry Pis or multiple, you know, voltage nodes in order to get like this concept of multiple nodes. Um, we can do that really easily with LDK. And because the whole concept of a node to people is, is just the pub key, right? Um, a pub key is how you kind of identify a certain node. Um, that's just that's just keys. So we take the keys portion of that and spin that up multiple times. Meanwhile, you know, a lot of the other components are all all shared. Um, so it makes it really easy to do things like spinning up multiple nodes um, in the same instance. Meanwhile, in L and D, you know, you just have that one node. Um, and that's all you have. Um, like I said, you don't need to fork LD, LDK so much. Um, sometimes we do fork LDK, um, but it's, it's still an early project. And um, you know, when we can, we try to upstream those changes back to LDK. Um, and like I said, it's it's super embeddable, so you can run this in all sorts of applications um, to kind of get a non-custodial Lightning solution. Um, some of the cons: you're pretty much doing everything yourself. Uh, like I said, um, you still need to have a decent understanding of how Lightning works, like from a perspective of opening channels um, and, and things like that. And it's still pretty early. Cash App has been using this in production for about a year, um, which is really cool. Uh, there hasn't been too many production solutions about OK yet, um, but I'll, I'll talk about some of the example applications that, um, that have been created before. And then, yeah, it doesn't do any on-chain wallet stuff, so you kind of have to like bring your own there. Um, some of the solutions that, you know, so what, what can you actually do with it? Here's some examples. Um, I've, I've created a few over the last year. The first one I created was called Hidden Lightning Network. And let me just, uh, let me just kind of go there really quickly. What I did with this project was um, I probed the entire Lightning Network, or not the entire, I probed a lot of the Lightning Network to find um, private channels. So I did this with LDK, and I just started sending a whole bunch of probes. Um, I won't dive too much into detail, like how that actually works, but there's um, tons of channels that I found that were supposed to be private channels, but I found them anyways. I think um, I don't think I have the latest numbers here, but it's almost 10,000 channels that I found doing this. Um, I did it with LDK. I didn't have to use LDK for it. Uh, I did this in L&D <laughs> first. It only took like an hour. Uh, and less than 100 lines of code. So, you know, and, and some some solutions aren't the best doing it without AK, but I was learning it. I did the proof of concept at a hackathon with Paul, um, and it only took like a day, um, but it took like a whole month to finish that. Oh, yeah, I got that there. Um, create another little simple application. Um, 
uh, LDK has what they call like a uh, sample node um, that you can kind of take and like, you know, start building your first uh, little LDK node. And I'll, I'll kind of go through that a little bit more later. Um, but I took that and I swapped out its networking component to be like a Tor compatible one. So you can actually connect to Tor nodes um, with it. And, you know, that didn't take too long to complete, but, you know, it doesn't have too many changes. But um, just an example of like how you could swap out the networking component really easily. Um, another one I did, um, got some help from Ben and Paul on this one. Uh, it's called LNSploit. It's a lightning exploit tool. And what I kind of did here is I built it into a, like straight into a text user interface. Um, so like what you see here is, is called a TUI and the node is actually running within, with inside uh, this program. So you can spin up many nodes, um, and you can like, you know, the whole purpose of this was to sort of like exploit um, some vulnerabilities in Lightning. We, we kind of did it to exploit some L&D vulnerabilities. And then it even like, you know, once you exploit those vulnerabil vulnerabilities, it, it broadcasts an old state to the Lightning network so you can actually like quote unquote steal funds um, from from the node if they're if they're offline and, and they never come back online. So the whole Barack bug last year where L and D broke, um, you know, I did it was around the same time as TabConf and I kind of went through the process. I did a workshop there, like how to actually steal funds from an L and D node that had that vulnerability. Um, and then latest L LDK project, I, I keep saying that I can only do like so many LDK projects in a year because it is very time consuming and it is a lot of effort. Um, and each one is kind of unique. So you kind of have to do it all yourself. But the one we're working on right now called Mutiny Wallet, it's, um, it's letting you know that it runs inside of the web browser. Um, what we kind of do is build all the LDK pieces in Rust. We compile that. Um, to WebAssembly, and we load it in as a TypeScript package. Um, and then we have just like a React, you know, progressive web app that loads that TypeScript packages. Um, it's sort of like we did our own bindings, basically. And we created a node, um, exported it over TypeScript, and then now we can um, right there from, from a browser do all the sending and receiving um, and everything that a Lightning wallet, you know, should do. Um, and that was, you know, a lot more involved. Um, and it took all three of us like six weeks to kind of get the first concept of it. Um, but we'll be iterating it from there. Um, other projects you can reference like Sensei, Cash App, Blue Wallet, a few others. Um, you know, Sensei, I don't think it's really in development anymore, but they were trying to be the sort of like L&D of LDK. So they're trying to be that full package solution that anyone can just like take and, and start using. Um, and here's kind of like an example of, of what their what their interface look like. Cool thing about Cash App, um, they use it in a very professional you know um, professional development way. Like they, um, I think I have an example here. Yeah, um, they use kind of like dis their distributed system development process to kind of take the LDK nodes. Um, they use the Java bindings, I believe, since since they do everything in Java. Um, and they, you know, they have, you know, MySQL, they have DynamoDB, they have some queue stuff going on, um, and they distribute the um, nodes across like three different ones. Um, so it's like a really cool example of them taking, you know, the LDK logic and kind of packaging it up in their own, their own solutions. Um, Blue Wallet has an, a non-custodial LDK version built in. Um, they're sunsetting their old version, but I think you have to like, if you, if you're in Blue Wallet and you and you create a new Lightning node, if you tap Lightning like seven times, it kind of unlocks the LDK version. Um, that's like been done for like a year almost, um, but they haven't like announced it or, or launched it because I think they're waiting on some LSP integrations first. Um, but this is really cool because they took LDK, they did um, the TypeScript bindings there, and they put it into their React native application. And then Lightning uh, Validate and Lightning Center, I kind of explained that earlier. They kind of take the keys part of LDK and, and um, you know, have that on a different device. Um, there's other solutions that you could build from here. Someone's building a sort of like sec secure enclave version of LDK where all the keys live um, on this like trusted environment, like, you know, the Intel uh, SGX kind of stuff. And so that there's quote unquote like no, um, no way the private keys can 
be taken off. Now there's security concerns with SGX that <laughs> may not be as secure as people think, but um, it is a really cool concept that you can, you know, you're, you're in a very limited environment if you're trying to run something in, in SGX. So it's really cool that LDK can run in that kind of environment. Um, but, but yeah, so some of the, uh, like how to actually get started, some of the, uh, some of the actual workshop stuff. They have um, their docs page here, and it's pretty thorough. I'll go through a little bit of it. Um, it's just like lightningdevkit.org, um, and then there's this like tab up top called docs. Um, they kind of go through the introduction of it. So like if you if you are building something in Rust, you can easily check out the documentation there. Um, I I believe this yeah there was just an update last night, so all this is uh, is kind of different, but. Um, if you're building like uh, an iOS application, you, they have some Swift bindings here that you can use to actually like start to do, you know, build build a build a node straight in like native Swift. Um, they have this like architecture page that kind of describes like how it actually works behind the scenes. Um, to like describe some of this, you know, there's a lot of different modules in LDK. So, like I said earlier, the the whole networking part, you kind of have to bring that module over. And they have some examples for pretty much all of these, um, but you can sub and swap them if you want. So, with the networking side, they have some native ways that you can um, you start using their package for the networking part. And I'm not sure if they're uh, there's like a tutorial page here somewhere uh, at the top here. Um, I can kind of show you a little bit of like what it what it means to like have. Okay, well that that didn't work. <laughs> um, I think I have it here, unless they literally just. Got it though. Okay, yeah, I don't know why that link didn't work. Um, if we look at the Rust part and go to sort of the networking. Let's see. Yeah. No. They they make it pretty simple to just like use their basic stuff and kind of like uh, work right from the get go. So here's like you know maybe like a dozen lines of code. Um, you import their Lightning Net Tokyo package. Um, this is just the Rust version. They have a full tutorial in Java as well. Um, but you import their package. You say what port you want to listen on. You you bind to that port, and then in a loop, you just sit there and you're you're waiting to listen for any networking to happen. Um, and if like a TCP stream gets set up. It'll spin a thread up and it will call Lightning Net Tokyo set up inbound. And what this does, you have this concept. There's another module in LDK called the peer manager. You you take uh, the peer manager and you take the stream of data coming in, and you kind of bind the two together so that way um, all the peer to peer connection stuff gets that stream of data. And then your node can actually start talking to another peer on the network. So, you know, in just these like lines of code, you just like you set up a listening, um, you set up a listening port, and then you got your node talking, you know, talking to anyone else that starts listening to it. Um, yeah, I kind of showed off the Swift. I mean, we'll go mo more through like the tutorial and like you know what else is there, but. Um, you know, if you're interested in any of the TypeScript stuff, um, they have they have an npm package as well, um, where you can start. You know, it's it's all it's all sort of like the same. Um, it's all the same bindings. It's just like you do it in like the TypeScript way or or the um, or the Java you know the Java way or or the Rust way. I'm not sure if there's like a good example of that. But um, yeah, check check those out if you want to build like your own there. And there's even like a React Native example. Synonym is experimenting with this as well. So they kind of took they took the um, the TypeScript bindings and they built it into a React Native application. So um, I don't know if there's any like quick 
code I can go through here. Uh, maybe not in this area, but yeah, if you're interested in like sort of building um, in any of the languages you're familiar with, that's also why I didn't want to go through too too heavy into like setting up your own LDK node because I figure there's going to be a lot of developers in the room that you know kind of have their preferred language. So like going through the Rust version of it, you know, someone may not ever do that again, or they may not not know Rust. But um, yeah, there's a lot of good tutorials there. Um, I kind of explain this a little bit about how it does work. Um, like I said, the networking part is one. The chain interactions, like, oh, it has certain interfaces where it's like, okay, give me this block, um, and then you sort of like decide how you want to give it that block. They have some examples again there as well. Um, the wallet portion is another. Uh, the persistent. There's, there's, I think in total like 20 different components of LDK, so it's like quite involved. Um, there's definitely way more than just these, uh, these five here. Um, but we'll kind of go through a little bit of that here, and I'll start. I'll start kind of going through the each section. It's like I hope that you know what we can kind of do, or what you guys can kind of do afterwards is is um, you know if this is if if building an LDK node is interesting to you, um, I want to kind of like let you guys get familiar with the different steps and the different things involved in building. Um, an LDK based wallet, and then from there you can sort of like you know feel comfortable knowing that you know some of these concepts, and then you know take whatever language bindings that you're familiar with, and kind of do it your own way from there. But before I go into any of that, is there any like quick questions? Yeah. So, is there a um, with all the language bindings available? It seems like it would be useful to know Rust to know the language bindings. But is there like a way of describing think like when it would be worth actually learning Rust and when it would be worth just kind of using a language you know and just kind of building on top of it? Right, right, right. And the question was like, you know, should you know Rust a little bit at all um, before getting started? Uh, and and you really don't need to. Um, they, I, I don't know if they have their docs page for for Java here somewhere. Uh, let's see. But all their documentation should be the same, like the same comments across it all. It's just, um, you know, what in whatever language they're doing. So it should look, if you're going through their documentation in whichever language, TypeScript, Java, or Rust, all the documentation should be the same. Um, I don't think there's any, unless you actually need to, like, figure out what it, like, what it's actually doing under the scenes. Like, if it's not, if it's not behaving like you expect, um, you may want to know a little rust to see how it's behaving, see if there's a bug with it. You know, it's very possible there's a bug with it or it doesn't do exactly what you think it should do. Um, but ideally, like all the documentation, it, it's it's done in the language that you prefer. Pretty much all of the namings of, of things are the same as well. If we look at the fee estimator in Java, um, you know, they, they each language has their own way to do interfaces. But you know, you say here's a fee estimator. You have to do this function that says uh, get s sat per one thousand weights, and then in the in the Rust version of that, it's the same exact thing. Get s sat per one thousand weights. So all of the bindings should be like named exactly uh, the same. And then if there are any documentation um, comments on that in Rust, uh, that should translate over to the Java version as well or, or the TypeScript version. Um, just a curiosity, um, preferred, preferred languages that you guys kind of use, um, just like shout them out if JavaScript. JavaScript. <laughs> <laughs> Haskell. I wonder if you do. But cool. Um, yeah. yeah. I I use Vim. Yeah. I'm a Vim maxi. Is there like a cool plugin that helps with using Rust and Vim? Yeah. Uh, Rust and Vim. Um, I I use the. Uh, I use the COC, um, the co code of command or whatever it's called for all the um, 
code complete stuff. Um, and then there's some, I think Rust Analyzer has some Vim uh, packages as well. I think those are the only two I use for Rust stuff. I think for the most part, it behaves pretty well just from those. But I'll have to chat. A bit of an ambiguous question, but like how you mentioned at the beginning, like LDK is probably the best for building non custodial wallets. But if I want to build a non custodial wallet with like really simple features, uh, like getting an LDK, I kind of almost am re implementing Lightning Spec, or at least taking those modules and putting them together in some kind of way. Versus, like, why would not I use a green light or something where I can just have the infrastructure run for me and hand over a key to the user? Where, where is kind of that level of like advanced features where you would need to be working with LDK? Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. Sort of the like when to use something like green light versus when to use something like uh, like LDK. Um, I think green light and the, and the breeze SDK that they're building around it is still still pretty early too itself. I don't know if it's ready yet for integration. So that that would be you know one point. It's like whether or not it's ready. Um, another point I would say is you know you you. And maybe maybe you don't care about this uh, uh, for like if you're building something simple, but the privacy perspective, like you are running this on um, Greenlight servers, so yeah, you have the keys somewhere else. Um, but what if their servers were to go away? You could almost argue, you know, I don't, and I don't think any of the data is saved on the user's device either. So it's like you know, you could say, what what good is the keys if? If you don't have the data to go with it, so um, you know whether or not it's still custodial at that point. It, you know, with Lightning stuff, custodial versus non-custodial is, is a lot fuzzier than um, you know just on-chain Bitcoin and custodial versus custodial uh, or non-custodial. So yeah, like if you don't, if 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 some server is like generating. Um, you know, saving all the data for you, it's generating all the invoices, then like you almost trust that server um, just as much as you're uh, as you're trusting them um, with, not with your funds. Like once you receive the funds, you're good. You should be good. But if any of that data isn't like backed up or saved on on Greenlight servers, then you're kind of shit out of luck. Um, so, and I haven't looked too deeply at Greenlight. Or um, the Breeze SDK integrations, but that's sort of the thing. It's like, yeah, it'll be easier, but you are running on someone else's server. So, like, how much that does that cost? What are they charging for that? Um, how much data do they see? And then, at the end of the day, is it is it safe? Yeah. What are you doing? Anything else about the uh, the React Native? Like, so Synonym's got theirs, Muon's got theirs, but it seems like those have been like kind of out and around for a while. Are, are, are they both sort of waiting on LSP things to develop? And is there any other reason why you think there's no, unless there is, React Native apps that are out there using this? And like, put it another way, if you had to make a React Native app with LDK in the next week, like, what would your concerns be? Is it is it liquidity, or what else has to be solved? Yeah, I, I think the LSP one is 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 the major concern, and I think um, Synonym has been very active in the um, LSP. Uh, I think there's like an LSP working group now as well, so they're they're trying to solve that problem because they don't like they don't want to ship a wallet where you know the, the it has all the offline problems. Uh, you know they they want offline receives really well. They want. Um, they want the inbound liquidity problem solved because otherwise, and, and this is like the first example of um, our, our Mutiny wallet where it's like, okay, you have to create all the wallet, uh, all the channels. You have to connect to peer. You have to do all these things. And I think in the blue wallet example, um, if, if you like, you know, hit that lightning button seven times, you have to do all, all of that yourself. So I don't think they want to go back in time, sort of, sort of say, and like, oh, okay, now you're managing your own lightning node all over again. It just happens to be on your phone. Um, so like, I, I think the LSP part of it is, is a, it's a major, um, 
concerned with them not releasing it, but like it's 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 a concern no matter like what mobile wallet you're you're sort of creating, right? Like you kind of have to solve this problem. So I don't think there's any limitations um, for the on the React Native side. I know there's I know there's a couple other teams that are working on a React Native LDK node right now, um, which and they are <laughs> waiting on LSV solutions there too. Um, so I don't think it's an it's a React Native. Um, uh, specific thing. It's just the fact that if you're building a mobile wallet, um, you kind of have to solve the LSP problem at the same time. And, and LSP problem in this context is basically just like liquidity. Liquidity and channel management is is uh, well. Hope, um, you still have to do some channel management on the on the client side. But if 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 your only channel is with an LSP, then you know it's a lot. You know you kind of like move that behind the scenes. So I would say, yeah, liquidity channel management. Um, there's also uh, routing is a concern. Like how are you going to route data across the net or how are you going to route payments across the network? Um, if you've ever opened up Blue Wallet or sorry, uh, Breeze at any point in time, you'll notice that like it's always trying to sync and it feels like it always is taking like 10 minutes plus to sync. Um, so why, why use, you know, why sit there for 10 minutes, uh, when you can <laughs> to sync gossip data, when you can send an on-chain transaction in 10 minutes, right? Uh, so like, uh, trampoline based solutions are, are another thing that LSPs could solve. I know we're not there yet with trampoline, uh, async has it, um, with their Phoenix wallet, but I don't think anyone else has it yet. Uh, Electrum has it. Yeah. Uh, well, <laughs> yeah. No, who uses the Electrum lighting? You use it. Wow. Wow, I'm surprised that works. Uh, yeah, so Electrum has trampoline, which is good. Um, so yeah, there's there's two trampoline providers on the Lightning Network right now, uh, Electrum and, and Async. Um, but uh, the LDK has, and I, I have it in, in the slides too as well, but LDK has something called Rapid Gossip Sync. Um, which allows you to sync that gossip data um, in like in like less than a second. Like it's only like if you are using it at the very beginning, like a cold start, and you've never had a lightning wall before. It, it's like four megabytes of data you have to download. Um, but if you once you have the initial set of data, it's typically like less than one megabyte to get caught up to the gossip on Lightning from there. So, you know, LSPs are sort of going to turn into a bloated generic term where it's like, okay, well, if you're providing any services to a, a Lightning individual, then now you're an LSP. It's just like, what exactly are you solving as an LSP? Like, what is your service offering? Is it is it for just-in-time channels um, and just-in-time payments? Is it for routing, uh, routing payments? Is it trampoline? Um, you could even argue like some, you know, Bolt 12 offline async kind of stuff is like an LSP offering. So there's a lot of things that LSPs could offer to make the um, end user experience better. And those are just some of them. Cool. Yeah, yeah, no, great questions. Happy to answer any, any rest. The, the majority of what I had left was just kind of describing some of the individual packages, but I'm also very happy to answer any any specific questions. How do I get Rust Analyzer to stop yelling at you? <laughs> it will never stop yelling at you. <laughs> uh, if, if you do something like, um, sometimes it's like Clippy problems, so if you run Cargo Clippy, you'll see all the things that it wants you to do. So if you run Cargo Clippy dash dash fix, um, it tries to solve some of those automatically. Um, but, but yeah, Rust Analyzer does quite a, quite a bit of yelling. I mean, Rust itself does quite a bit of yelling, um, as well, but yeah. Um, yeah, just wanted to kind of go through some of these components because, uh, I know when I start describing the components, it's like, okay, well, what, what is actually going on here? Um, does anyone have a preference if we go through it in Rust or in Java? Uh, everyone's a Rust expert now. That's that's amazing. Paul did Paul did a good job last week. I'll let him know. <laughs> um, okay, so like, I, let me just like browse through this really quick. Yeah, there's like there's like 20 steps here in creating your own LDK node. 
Um, and before I begin, let me show you sort of the end result. Can you, uh, you should zoom in. Okay. Ben advocating for light mode? <laughs> what is this? Okay, so that should help there. Um, I could probably make GitHub light mode too. So here's sort of the, uh, it, it's called LDK sample, and it, it's kind of funny. I was talking to Jan, John Kentrell in, in Nashville a few weeks ago, and he just joined a new project, and uh, he, he was kind of like, you know, seeing how they were building. Uh, they're, they're launching a new LSP, which was just announced yesterday, called C equals. Um, and he, it's kind of funny. He, he joined, and he saw how their LSP was, and it was like, oh, okay, cool. Another another LDK node where they just forked LDK sample and started building building a new LDK node. I mean, to be fair, like I've done that so many times with my projects, and it's just like the end result of what you get is, uh, you know, you can go pretty far with it to start out with. So I won't go through all of this code. I mean, I think there is quite a bit here, but this is sort of like the end result. So like after you get through um, this like setup, yeah, there we go. Uh, this like building a node and without a K and Rust setup, you should have something that's really similar to this. I think John just like moved on to different projects. So he, he did join Block um, a few weeks ago to build out. An LSP solution, so that that's probably one of the things that uh, that he kind of decided to do instead. Um, yeah, uh, you'll, there's 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 quite a bit involved. I won't go through this example too much, uh, but we'll kind of cover it in the tutorial page. But um, there's something called like handle LDK events, and this is kind of like. Uh, what you have to do yourself. So it's like LDK can't do everything for you. Like you can you can start, you know, once you get all the components ready and you start running the node, um, there's going to be events that LDK generates for you that you kind of have to solve yourself. Um, stuff like funding generation ready. So it's like, okay, you, you wanted to open a lightning channel with another peer. It's ready for you to fund that channel, to um, put on on-chain uh, you know, transaction for. So this is like one of the examples of like you have to come in yourself and, you know, you, uh, they have an example Bitcoin D client RPC. So they're just calling that. It's like, okay, create the raw transactions with these outputs. Um, now, now fund it um, by adding inputs and then sign the raw transaction and then and then you call the LDK channel manager and you said, okay, funding transaction generated and you pass to that final transaction. And then this is where LDK does uh, the protocol stuff from there. So it's like kind of going back to Austin's point of like, okay, you know, there's, you know, how much like protocol stuff do you kind of have to do here? And, and to be fair, like not any, like LDK will um, handle all the protocol messages and, and all of that. You just have to say like, it just occasionally says like, hey, you know, you're, you're trying to open a channel. It's ready for it to be funded. Fund it for us. Give me back the transaction. And then LDK will do the rest. Um, and there's a ton of events, I think maybe like, or yeah, maybe just like a dozen or so of like things that you should handle yourself. Um, I think the example goes through some of it, but you know, this this tutorial kind of also walks through, okay, like initialize uh, the Bitcoin D client, like set a data directory, um, you know, go through the networking steps. And it kind of, the cool thing is like, if you're following step by step with the uh, tutorial page above, it kind of shows you what it looks like in the end if you're following all the steps correctly. So what you'll get to at the very end is something like, um, should be like a start. Like you, the very last step is like to set up this background processor, and then like let it run. And then from there, it's like cool. 
now, you know, and this is where their their application logic kicks in. It's like, okay, once once LDK is running, like start the actual program. Um, and I don't know if they have a picture of it. Um, But it's it's basically just like a CLI tool, um, but with the LDK node running straight into the CLI tool. All right, so the the first step that they kind of have you go through, um, and sometimes I, when I'm doing a new project, I just like write bogus numbers in here because it's like okay, fee estimation stuff. Like I don't care. Like if I <laughs> once I get to the point of like actually doing on-chain fee estimation stuff, then it's like, cool, I got a lightning node already. So then I go back and, you know, I write some to-dos here, but basically it wants you to, uh, whenever you're going to open a channel or, like, fund a channel or things like that, it wants it wants to know, like, what SAP per byte um, the network currently at, is at. So it wants you to handle um, with, like, a with like a fee estimator itself. So I think in the LDK example, um, they just, like, fetch that from Bitcoin D. Um, actually, let me pull that back up because I, for some reason, their documentation there doesn't go through what it should look like. Okay, so they, in their example code, they set up um, a Bitcoin D client, which already has some of the interfaces for um, getting the fee estimator. So they just. They just say, okay, this this object, clone it, call it the fee estimator, and then it already has some of the interfaces that it needs. So they kind of like bypass, um, not bypass, but they kind of already do the step here. Um, but but what I typically do is I just say like, okay, like min fee rate, I just I just set that and then move on. And then you got like a little fee estimator. And they have some like notes, and then you can even like go through for all the examples too. They have like documentation on like um, what it all means um, and how to and what it does. Um, they also want like a little log or two um, that way you can log LDK related events, and they kind of provide like a little example one here that does its job. So you know some of the first components are just like. You know they seem small and little, and, and and why would you need them? But you know they they kind of as you start going through and building the LDK node, you'll realize like in the order that you build it, you'll start passing those components to pretty much everything. So like everything's going to want, every component is going to want a logger because it wants to be able to log messages, right? So um, there's some basic stuff here that you pretty much reuse across all of your uh, LDK modules. Um, broadcast interface. So this is to be able to like broadcast transactions. So like LDK, if there's like a, a, a channel closure or even worse, like if there's a forced channel closure or you know an HTLC um, event that you have to broadcast on chain, you need to be able to pass um, the broadcast interface uh, to LDK. So like you, this is another example of like LDK doesn't know how to broadcast the transaction, right? You have to do that work. So, the way we kind of do that mutiny is just we just like broadcast it to like Explora, um, and you know we just push that transaction and we broadcast it there. Um, in the LDK sample tutorial, they're again using their Bitcoin D clients, and and maybe I should pull up their Bitcoin D client as well because um, that's another reference code here that's really useful. So, you don't need like Explorer or anything there. It just starts to, um, you know, there's also a block source here, but we'll get into that in a minute. Um, what they do is they say, okay, I have a Bitcoin D client here. It has the RPC connections. So let's implement fee estimator for it. So then it's where, this is where it like actually calls into the Bitcoin D client. Or actually, they the way they do it, they pull for fees continuously. Um, so that's maybe a bad example. But for broadcast channel, um, they actually go through, they have the Bitcoin D RPC, um, they call the transaction send raw transaction, um, you know, and that hopefully broadcasts it if there's no error. Uh, but other than that, this is how, you know, for just like, you know, a few lines of code, maybe a dozen or two, um, here's how you like implement the broadcast interface. Um, 
so and there's going to be several components that use that as well. That's why it kind of happens at the beginning. Um, the persisting stuff is is really fun and and but also like really critical in LDK. Um, you want to make sure that whenever you're saving any data, uh, you know, LDK is saving any data, that you, like, really have that persisted. Otherwise, like, you know, if you've ever had, like, a corrupted database in L&D or, you know, something else, like, uh, uh, like if you're using Raspberry Pi, sometimes that can just, like, flake out um, sometimes if you're using just a normal hard disk. Uh, and that could lead to like loss of funds. If you have like a bad, uh, if you have like a previous update, but you don't have like the latest update that actually happened, and you didn't persist that to disk, you could you could lose funds, um, which is <laughs> which makes it really really critical to do this. So um, in in LDK to kind of get started with like their persister, um, you kind of there's like this concept of the channel signer and channel monitor, and there's 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 honestly like quite a a bit of different components that that save data, um, and I won't get too much into them. Um, in an LDK sample, uh, I think it's somewhere here. They just like save it to a file, um, just like a normal a normal file. They have this concept of um, I think it's like a key value store that they do, and they just save it all there. I'm not sure. Yeah, it's just like it's just like open file and then and then save as bytes. Um, if you wanted to, you can like get into like SQL things um, for saving data. I think Sensei used SQL too, but I think for all the LDK things, it just was a simple key value store uh, like thing in an SQL table. Um, so they kind of uh, they didn't really need SQL for, it, but they decided to do it anyways. But um, you know, there's some persisting that goes on. Um, I would definitely highly suggest like reading all the documentation on on the persisting because uh, it can be a lot. It can be pretty critical. Um, and I believe some of this persisting stuff just changed last night. So, uh, yeah, the TBD on that. Um, transaction filters. So LDK does need to be able to get specific transactions, um, and if you're not giving it full blocks, you know, if you're using something like BIP 157 or 158 or you're using Electrum as your backend, then you need to be able to get transactions. So what they do here, they provide these like register transaction events. Um, and then as a transaction is, you know, as LDK says, hey, I'm really interested in this specific transaction ID, it's then your job to you know, pull that transaction down and watch for any uh, transactions happening to it, um, like like if it gets spent or or things like that. And then if that happens, you have to go back to LDK and say, hey, you know, this event just happened to this transaction ID, and then LDK will take it from there. Um, chain monitor, kind of another, or yeah, there's a yeah chain monitor, which is another example of that. Um, some of the chain monitor, channel monitor, channel manager stuff can get a little um, overwhelming as as you're going through it as well, especially since they're like similar names and they kind of do similar things. Um, but the chain monitor's job is just, of course, watch the chain, and then channel monitor's job is to kind of like handle uh, the interactions between the channel. So um, if I'm looking at some of the... Um, LDK sample stuff. They have some examples here of like how to do some of that um, channel mon uh, channel manager stuff, uh, and it's kind of in their disk um, their disk file. So again, they're for all their uh, data persisting stuff. They just like save that as a file, and they read from it occasionally. So it can kind of look complex digging into it, but you know they they did like a simple bytes parsing thing. Um, key manager is another important aspect. So this one's kind of cool. You just like, uh, you know, LDK won't generate any randomness for you too. So you kind of, you have to provide it, um, you know, a random seed function. But uh, you you create the seed. Um, you, you should do, you know, the correct cryptographic randomness for it. Um, and then, then you kind of create what's called a key manager for it. And then this will 
take in the seed and then it'll handle all the keys for LDK from there. So like with L, with Lightning, uh, with Lightning Network specifically, um, there's a lot of different keys involved with it. Uh, there's ephemeral keys that are used just for peer-to-peer -peer communication. Um, there's also keys, uh, LDK doesn't, I think there's a few examples where LDK will do an on-chain uh, you know, on-chain transaction stuff like the like the two of two, I believe. So, you know, they need the keys to be able to like have these two of two transactions, their HTLC transactions. They need keys for it. Um, I think Shirt Bits did a blog once where they kind of explained that that there's six different types of keys um, that the Lightning Network uses. So, you know, you pretty much pass it a seed, um, and then this key manager will will handle all the keys from there. No. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, LDK doesn't use any BDK stuff. So, for uh, um, the way they sort of solved it uh, in this LDK sample, they just used Bitcoin D um, uh, as as the sort of like keys backing store there, and and signing and broadcasting and stuff like that. Um, Channel monitor is another thing um, that LDK does. Uh, you'll see the channel monitor will happen whenever like, you know you start creating channels and stuff like that. And similar to the other persistent modules, they just like provided an example of like um, you know reading it from reading it from a file. So again, I I won't dive too much into details of some of these channel monitors and channel manager stuff because it's. It's uh, it can be quite involved, and they have a lot of documentation on it. But in the end, like there's there's several different things that need to like monitor um, a channel to make sure that like it's not um, you don't get in a situation where you could lose funds. Um, and here's another here's some more channel manager stuff. Um, it it again it's it's quite involved, but they they. This is another reason why probably a lot of people use some of their LDK sample code and just run with it, because um, this is one of the examples where, like, if you're building it from scratch, you may not like really know what to do. So they provide example code. And this is why it's really helpful to have this example code here. Like, you know, after you have this set up, you don't really need to know too much about what's going on. <laughs> you just copy and paste the code and, and move on. Uh, in, in my opinion, uh, that's pr like the ch channel monitor stuff is kind of the more complex stuff to really understand. And then, and then after you initialize like some of the channel monitors and 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 channel manager stuff, you have to like catch them up to the latest block tip. So like if your LDK node has been offline for a little while, it won't have the latest blocks. So. Um, and the channel monitor and channel manager stuff kind of need to make sure that, you know, with, with, with Lightning, there's like time locks involved. Um, so if you're not, if you're not, if, if, if you have a channel that's, or an HTLC that's about to, um, you know, sort of expire or it's been too long since you like check the status on, you can get into some tricky situations. So, you know, after you started up your node for the first time or after a while, you need to like get the data. So they have some interfaces here that you should provide. So it's like whenever whenever LDK calls get header, um, you should write the code that like gets the latest latest uh, hash. Um, same thing with block. Same thing with best block. Like kind of you kind of feed some of this into it. Um, for fetching the latest block of latest transaction information, and you give that to the channel monitors, and um, that way it can keep up with the latest state. And then, yeah, there again, more channel monitor, chain monitor stuff. Um, you give the uh, you have to give the channel monitor to the chain monitor so that it can. Uh, it can monitor for the specific uh, UTXOs that are involved in the channel. So there's a little bit of uh, some passing of um, modules to each other there. And then the net graph message handler. So 
And, you know, whenever you're a lightning node and you like connect to another lightning node on the network, you typically like pass gossip data um, to each other. So the net graph message handler kind of um, uses that uh, to sort of pretty much saves all that graph information and you can save it to the disk. I believe the LDK sample code um, somewhere here goes through the effort of, um, yeah, it, it saves the network to the disk. That way, like if you load up, um, later on in the future, if you restart the node, you don't lose any of that graph data. And since then, like LDK has implemented something called rapid gossip sync. I explained that a little bit earlier, where you can now read a uh, network graph from a specific server. But they have some examples here where it just pretty much saves the disk. From there, uh, the peer manager, that's, that's another fun one. Um, this handles all the communication between um, your peers. So like it wants the net graph handler so that it can you know, save the gossip data from the peer. It also wants the channel manager so that you know, if you make a channel with this peer, you can, um, you can handle uh, it. You know, it will handle all that stuff with it. Um, also needs um, the keys involved. Um, because again, there's like ephemeral keys that are created each time your your node connects to another peer. So it kind of needs the keys involved there. Um, and then it needs all these like message handlers uh, that you've created before. And then that's sort of like the init setup. Now it's just like, okay, you, you have an LDK node and it's always fun getting into this part. They split it up into you know, initiating, initializing your LDK node for the, um, you know, whenever your program runs. And then it's like, here's all the things involved in actually running your LDK node. So like I, I showed earlier, the networking component, that's like, okay, cool. Um, we have our LDK node. The peer manager handles all the peer-to-peer -peer connections. So we just need to open up a socket um, a TCP socket so that other nodes can talk to us or create a connection to us. Um, and then it, then that Lightning Peer Manager takes that data and runs, uh, runs through it. Um, and then, you know, like I said earlier, like you need, if you're launching LDK, um, you just restarted it, it needs to catch up to the chain tip. Um, you also should have um, something uh, in your code that just continuously monitors the, the chain. That way, if you know as blocks come in while your application's running, it has access to that data. So they kind of solved that here. Um, they use the block source that we created earlier in, in step nine, and they just like run a loop that continuously tries to get the best chain tip. The event handler, I kind of explained that a little bit earlier. Um, some of the here here's like a consolidated list of some of the things that you know LDK will create events for that you pretty much you have to go through and handle yourself. So whenever a channel open is ready, um, you gotta you know create the on chain transaction for that. Um, whenever you receive a payment, uh, you may want to um, you know process it, um, or you know when a payment's claimed, or when you send payment, or a payment fails. Um, some of these events you may not want to do anything for. Like if a payment failed, you just say, okay, hey, I don't care, continue on. Maybe if a payment failed, you want to like process the reason why it failed. Um, when I was doing probing stuff, I, I used that one um, really heavily because there's specific errors that, that get returned if a payment failed. So I wanted to see what error and why that payment failed. Um, since then, they've added some probing stuff here anyways. That wasn't here when I first started. Um, so now they will tell you, okay, you try to do a probe and it was successful, or you try to do a probe and it failed, and they'll give you some information about that. Um, and yeah, some of these are just uh, uh, open channel requests, like someone's trying to open a channel to you. Um, I'm using that for some just-in-time zero-conf channel stuff. So like if someone's trying to open up a channel to me and I trust that peer, um, I can say I don't want to wait for any confirmations. I'm just going to consider this channel active immediately. And that's one of the things that um, LDK lets you do uh, if, if you trust that specific peer's pub key. 
Um, and then, yeah, when channels close, you have to do some things there, uh, you know, or at least get alerted by it. It'll tell you. Um, and if someone backed out of a, of a channel, it'll tell you that as well. Again, like some of those you can skip, um, and they have documentation on, you know, each one of those events if you want to read more about them. Um, almost done with the components, you know, so as, as you, like, once you get through all the events that you have to implement, um, you get into this, uh, you're almost done. Um, there's this probabilistic score, so, like, each time you send a payment on Lightning Network, if it fails, um, you know, it, it, it probably won't pick that, you know, same path again, so it'll try to find a different route, um, and LDK provides some example code here like you can always have your own score and you know if you want to use something like uh, uh, well I don't know what else they have available but um, I think Sensei for a little while wanted to do something where the score was saved on a remote server so that everyone used the same score so like if some routes or bad routes like you know what, what I mean by bad route like there's not enough liquidity between certain peers um, in a certain direction. Uh, Sensei wanted to do it where everyone shared that data amongst each other, you know, just so which route is good, which route's not good. Um, and all the nodes could use that so they can have better better routing, better, you know, better and quicker routing where they're not going through failed payments. Um, so LDK kind of has this concept of probabilistic score that says like, okay, I probably can't route this payment down this path. Let's pick a different one. Um, so they, they just have like in two lines of code, you can create their example, um, you know, default score. Um, they have a concept of the invoice pair that I believe they just got rid of. So that's, uh, I, don't know, I don't know, Ben Ben did that work of removing it. Uh, I don't know what they switched that out to or not. Okay, so they completely got rid of this, and now you just use the channel manager for uh, the invoice pair. But this this pretty much did all the work of like, you know, paying the invoice. You could specify how many times should it retry the payment before it finally fails, and you pass it to the channel manager, the router, um, and and things like that. But now you can ignore that step. Um, and then yes, yeah, the more persistent stuff. I don't know why that's at the very end. Um, but it was essentially, oh, yeah, for, for the channel manager and then the graph, like how do you want to persist that data? Um, and they have, I think, an example that's called KV persister, just a key value store persister, um, to make it really easy to save specific data. And then one of the last things that's always a fun one, the background processor. So this kind of makes sure that all things that need to run in the background um, actually happen. So again, like all the different components are sort of standalone um, from, you know, the persi uh, persister to the invoice pair, channel manager, chain monitor, network graph, peer manager, um, you know, all those kind of run on their own. Um, so the background processor takes all those things, you know, pretty much is like one big for loop that's like, okay, has it, how many seconds has it been? Um, the channel manager needs to run every every like five seconds or something, or um, you know the peer manager should run every one second to make sure that it's processing all the events as it's talking to another peer. So um, for a while we had to run our own background processor um, at Mutiny, but like they've added some code changes to it where it can run really well on the on the web. Um, so we're now using their default one, which again, like if you need to, it, this you know this could be an example where you should maybe know a little bit of Rust, like dig into the code. But if it's like doing something that you like don't exactly agree with, um, that you want to handle it in a different way, then you can go in, look at the code for what the background processor is doing, and sort of like copy and paste that component. So there there are some examples as we're, like we're not going through and like forking LDK. Um, whenever we need like a custom solution, we just like take their little module, you know, that we just like copy and paste like a hundred lines of code that that do all the background processor stuff, and we just decide to do it our own way um, uh, if we need to. So you know, we can, you know, th they have an example here where it's just like a couple lines of code, um, but sometimes you may want to go in there and, and add your own custom background processor. Um, and I think the last thing here is just 
broadcast node am announcements. So like if you're a lightning node with like a public channel and you want to like show up on the public graph that people can, you know, route through you or connect to you, then I think this just, uh, yeah, this has some code here. Every 60 seconds, like try to broadcast, you know, it tells the channel manager to broadcast uh, your node announcement. Um, you can put your node alias here and what, what port you're listening on. And Lightning nodes, I still think they have this concept of colors, which I, don't, I never understood, uh, you know, why that's there. But uh, you can color your node if you want. Um, but other than that, that's... Uh, that's all the LDK components. So thanks for thanks for uh, going through that torture with me. There's a lot there, <laughs> but but luckily there's not any more components than that. So you know if <laughs> yet there used to be like 15. Uh, now there's 19. Um, but yeah, that's. Uh, it, it, some of it, it requires like digging into a little bit more to really understand what's going on, and I don't think I did it justice on some of the channel manager monitor stuff. That still hurts my head, but um, you know, just copy and paste some of this code, and you'll probably be okay. <laughs> but any any questions? I, I think there's like one or two more slides to go through. But any questions on some of the modules themselves, and like maybe how they interact with each other, or um, Anything there? What do you use for your database? For uh, we use um, the browser storage. Yeah, yeah. For now, um, we want to we want to have. We can't use IndexedDB yet, um, so a lot of um, rest. Some of the rest side of the code here is is non async. So in order to use IndexedDB, you have to use async uh, methods to interact with that storage. But with local storage, you don't need, it's all sync. So because we can't call, we can't, in WASM, we can't do any, well, any front end can't block in the browser, right? You can't call any blocking code. Um, so you can't call, you can't block on that. Um, you can't call the async function and then block on the result of that, right? Um, so we can't do an async in, an, in a sync function. Um, yeah, but we do want to eventually, um, we have some ideas of kind of how to get away from that so we can go to index DB because local storage isn't, isn't very good. And we also want remote storage too. Nice. Um, yeah, just a few more slides here on some of the, yeah, kind of already showed you um, if you wanted to, I think they even have like a specific page here. Um, yeah, it's this running a sample node documentation where it pretty much like tells you, okay, install Rust, set up Polar, and then clone the LDK sample and then run this command. And then you'll have like um, the LDK sample node be fully running and, and ready to connect on your on your voltage node. Oh, okay. this is what I was looking for earlier. And then like once it starts up, um, you know it tells you where the logs are saved. You know saved to this, a directory on your folder uh, on your computer, and then it tells you your node ID. And then from there, like you can start typing in commands like connect peer or um, you know open channel and things like that. So if you want to, you know I I didn't want to like set up people with Polar and go through all of this. Um, but, you know, if you're really curious of like, okay, show me an LDK node, um, this LDK sample node, you know, should, should be able, you, you should be able to do that pretty simply. There's a lot of really cool Lightning ecosystem stuff um, for LDK, you know, as you start kind of going along through this. Um, like I said, Rapid Gossip Sync, you know, it's a huge, Huge thing for saving on, on gossip data. Um, they just added Explora transaction sync. So what we did at Mutiny, we kind of like had to run a fork of some code that was not ready yet <laughs> in order to get it to work because we didn't want to wait for this. But as of last night, it's now it's now a, a, an example um, way to get all your transactions and block data from Explora. Um, they have something that they're working on right now called version sync server. 
um, where you can actually save some of the block data to a server and have that have that sync uh, successfully and safely. Um, but that that may take a while until it's ready. Um, like I said, VLS, you know, abstracting the keys away from the node. Um, you can go there, learn more information on that. There's some, you know, BDK works really well with LDK. Um, we're using that for Mutiny Wallet, and that's um, and since they did as well. Um, they have a Discord and, and Matrix community if you want to sign up, and you know they have channels for like getting started and stuff. You, if you have any questions there, um, and they have something that it's in development. It's not it's not ready yet, but it's called LDK Node, and it's basically without you having to do. I like to describe it as LDK sample, but like a little bit more production ready. Um, so you should be able to just, um, well, it's, it's not a ready to go node because it's not ready yet. But um, you should be able to just like take their implementation and say, OK, LDK node, here's some configuration options, run. And you can embed that into your program and just get started from that way. So they, they took the feedback that everyone has said and that we walk through here like, oh, it's too hard to do all these like 20 different steps. And they're like, OK, we'll do the 20 different steps. We're going to do it in our own opinionated way, uh, maybe provide some, you know, some configuration options. But we'll do it our way. Um, and you can use it. And this is how you can get started with an LDK node. Um, so that's, that's an active development right now. I don't, I don't, don't think it's ready yet. Um, and then a little bit about Mutiny and like how we're doing it. So we, we took all the Rust, Rust code. Instead of, we did it in a, so I said there's TypeScript bindings already. So you can import this into your own, um, you know, React application and stuff. Um, we decided to go a different way. We didn't want to write the node implementation in TypeScript. We thought that was unsafe. <laughs> we thought that wasn't the way to go. Um, so we did. We built our node in Rust um, using all the LDK stuff. And then we expose a few simple interfaces to TypeScript um, so that the front end can, can call it easily. So things like connect peer or open channel, um, those are the TypeScript bindings that, that the front end will see. It won't see all of the stuff that's like, um, you know, you know, broadcast transaction or or connect or uh, any of the stuff I just showed and just walked through. The front end doesn't see any of that, and we just like packaged packaged it up to just say like, hey, connect peer, open channel, send payment, um, just like a dozen simple API commands. Um, but it all runs in the browser. It's just like all the logic's written in Rust. Um, it's a lot more safe, and then we we uh, compile that to TypeScript. Um, and we also, yeah, if you want to learn more about like our WebSocket proxy that we had to create to do that, um, you can even take our, we have the TypeScript package published. Um, so you can take our node manager. Um, it's, it's probably going to solve a similar problem as the LDK node um, concept that, that, that they have here. Um, but we have this as our TypeScript package. There's no, um, I guess there's no documentation or anything yet. It's just code. But you can take this and throw it into your front end browser um, to have like a node ready to go. Um, and then we have like our initial proof of concept version of, of Mutiny Web. And, and this is kind of like what it looks like right now. So like this is like a real Lightning node running into the web browser. You can like go through, um, connect peer. You can add some peers there who you want to connect to. Um, you know, things like open channel. You know, all that works. Uh, we have to connect here first. but And then all your UTXOs are there, and everything's ready to go. So it's just like our way of like taking all the LDK stuff and, and showing off that it can literally run anywhere. And we just like threw it into a web browser. Um, you click a link, and then you, like, you have a lightning node. It's kind of like what we're, we're running with there. Yeah. So is the persistence dependent on your browser's local storage? Yep. Right now, it's just in local storage. Um, I think I have it here. Uh, but yeah, we want to we want to of course add it add remote storage as well. Um, so like here's all the all the you know it's all key value store stuff too right now. So it's just like okay here's here's the um, 
some of this is like BDK stuff too, like different uh, key spends and, or sorry, um, derivation paths and stuff. But uh, there's there's some mnemonics. <laughs> I, I didn't encrypt this one. Uh, don't don't copy those words now. But um, but yeah, there's 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 a lot of different data we store here right now in local storage that we do want to be able to like store on a remote server uh, in an encrypted way. Well, there, there, you know, there's some stuff that is built into React to, to help that already. Um, but, but yeah, there's there's also the concept of the um, um, Crypto Web API too to kind of like um, put some of the private key management stuff um, into into the browser, um, like some of the native APIs that browsers typically have for you know doing safer encryption and decryption stuff. Um, so that. Uh, that Typically can't be extracted out too. That makes you know makes it safer. But yeah, you know cross cross site scripting stuff is definitely going to be something we have to make sure is is pretty pretty tightened up. Yeah, yeah. So we have um, we have a proxy, but it's just for networking um, right now. Um, so it just like takes the. Uh, I don't think I have any diagrams here, um, but it just the proxy just handles the communication part of lightning so everything runs right there in the web browser but if you're if you're connecting to another peer you kind of have to use a proxy um, to do that and you can run it yourself yeah 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 there, yeah, there could could be something there with secure cookies we'll have to we'll have to play around with that there's a certain aspect too where we don't want to um, be a single point of failure or anything so um, you know maybe you run your own or maybe because uh, you know, like right now this relies on like no other server besides like where you get your block data and where um, where you connect to another peer so there's no like logic server anywhere else which is a cool concept that we want to kind of keep as much as possible but yeah. Besides that, I think think that was it. Um, happy to happy to answer any other questions about LDK. Um, I hope you know, if you're really interested in building LDK stuff, I hope you now have the knowledge to like at least get started. I'm like that's that's like what you need to know to get started. But um, yeah, happy to answer any questions. Um, how do you think about the trade-offs? Um, like handing the user a note, because before, like, LDK and Greenlight, like, I had a very binary mindset of, like, there's custodial, and people are doing that for user experience, it can be a great user experience, and then there's non-custodial, and there's this huge jump to where the user's having to manage and worry about a lot more, it doesn't really work on the phone, but now it seems like we're reaching some kind of gray area balance, but... You know, what are you abstracting away from you? Like, do you only need to give the user a private key? I know we talked about, like, store, like storage and privacy concerns before, but, like, where, where is that ideal balance for what you give in control of the user? Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm hoping it gets to the point, at least um, the way we're going about it, where it's literally, like, you don't think about it all over again. So, like, something like... Um, Phoenix and Breeze, um, kind of like what they are abstracting out, or even Moon too, even though it's not a Lightning node, um, where they're trying to like abstract out all the channel logic and all of the um, all the um, swaps involved that they have to do. Where it's literally like they open the wallet and then like they make a payment. And now with with Breeze, they're they're kind of going back to the the server based model where it's like you interact with the node on the server. So like it's 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 an interesting area of, of what we're trying to solve with LDK, where now it's, you know, the the node is, you know, it used to be, especially the early version of Breeze, it used to be like, oh, running a node on an end user device, like that's just not going to work. Like it's just like it's too cumbersome, it's too big, it's too heavyweight, um, you know. So let's let's move away from that. And, you know, things like Voltage spun up, um, things like Umbral got easier to use, where you can like run a node yourself and kind of go with that model, and then your your phone or your wallet. Um, just connects to your server, and then that's where it does all the things. But you know, now it's um, an interesting area where the green light approach kind of comes in and says, well, now it's even easier to run a node on the server without you know custodial risk um, with your keys being there. 
Um, but now it's like the LDK on the other side is like, well, now it's easier to run a node on the end user device. So it's it's definitely going to be an interesting sort of like fork in the road of like, um, you know, which which approach do you kind of go? Um, so I hope that like, you know, users aren't still managing their channels themselves. Like, like all the stuff that I had um, on the mutiny screen, like, you know, this is just like our proof of concept wise. Like we're not going to have... Where we're, we're at least going to hide like all the ad channel stuff, like all the um, ad peer logic and stuff like that. Where it's literally just like we're hoping this little screen here is like pretty much what they see. Um, where it's just like, hey, you have a you have a sat balance. You can send and receive. Um, there's a node running on your phone, but like you don't need to know how that works. Um, you just have to like probably occasionally like open it to make sure that <laughs> your your funds are not being um, you know, force closed or anything like that, but um, I've got a question because yeah. uh, you mentioned Brace a few times, and Brace is like always thinking because it's downloading the Twitter stuff, mm-hmm. whereas Mutiny is not because it's just direct pipe to Explorer type thing. Like, why don't why doesn't other well, let's do that? Okay, uh, well, there, there is there is a sort of like privacy risk too of like just download like yeah. downloading the raw, um like fetching the raw transactions yeah. and, and stuff through it. Uh, but Breeze is also, I, I, I'm pretty sure another reason why Breeze sits there and waits for a little bit is, is because of all the gossip data on Lightning that, that it needs to sync. Um, so it does have to like open up um, peer connections to other nodes, Lightning nodes specifically to download all the gossip so that it has a good view of the route. Um, otherwise, it can like if it, if it's running off of a, a route data from like a week or two ago, it may not even know how to route a payment to a certain node. Um, so like there's there's multiple things that has to sync. Um, the neutrino stuff is one, uh, but then also the gossip as well. But whereas Mutiny just gets a copy of the channel graph directly and doesn't have to wait. Yeah. Well, right now it. it doesn't do that, but like we don't we haven't implemented the rapid gossip sync, but we will. But it will be just like here is all the gossip data condensed down into like the small little file that we give you. Um, there is a little bit of trust there. Like we could, we if we if we were being malicious, we could uh, not really malicious, but if uh, it's more of a privacy concern. But if we were being a bad actor, uh, we could exclude routes that. We didn't want you to go down, um, and you're like, and so that if we wanted to, we'd say, oh, all of your routes have to go through these nodes, and and you know, kind of limit you from there. But um, there's, just, there's a little bit of a privacy uh, trust there. But you can, you know, run your own rapid gossip sync server um, to pull all of the gossip from from that instead. Like everything we kind of want to go for. Like yeah, right now you are trusting Blockstream with, you know, by default um, some of your. Uh, some transaction history, or at least uh, some of the things you're interested in. Um, but you know, a lot of people have Electrum nodes anyway, so it's like you know, you could, if you wanted to, you know, more privacy, connect that up to your own Electrum node um, and kind of go from there. Cool. Any uh, any last questions? Awesome. Well, thanks guys for coming to this presentation, and hope you build on LDK.